Hello, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And we are live tonight, just that we don't know what day it is. We don't know what time it is. We're not even sure where we are. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> uh, we, Julia's here with me, too, but this was five weeks we were gone, and everything, they were taking all the shows out of the archives. But uh, So that's why you never know if it's live or not, but we're saying it's live tonight. This is the day after Thanksgiving. Until this is an archive. Yeah. Until it's in the archives, <laughs> anyway. Day after Thanksgiving, anyway. So we are back from a very long trip. But on that trip, we said we went to four countries, ten cities, mm-hmm. you said. Yeah. And we crossed so many time zones and so many date lines Back and forth. <laughs> Only one dateline. <laughs> well, we went one way and came back the other okay, way. Okay, we tr- crossed it twice. <laughs> so that uh, we, we really don't know what day it is, what time it is, because we kept losing hours, and then we lost a day. And uh, We got the day back. <laughs> we got it back. <laughs> then we get home and find out they had daylight saving time while we're gone, so that's another hour. So our bodies are totally confused. And they don't know what where we are, what country, or anything. Time to bring out the little violin. <laughs> well, a lot of places where I was doing the lectures, we were doing stay in just one day in each city. Mm-hmm. And I get up there and I say, I really don't know where we are. Didn't know what country we were in, what city we were in. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but we had some more adventures. And uh, I know the people who listen have told me before that, they like us to tell us about the trips when we get back because they said it's like uh, we take you along with us. And we're always noticing the strange and the unusual, the things that are different. Mm-hmm. And there's a few things that we saw that were unusual and strange and different. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't ever go for the just ordinary. It's got to be mm-hmm. different. Mm-hmm. But we've been gone. Well, I think they've had a couple, they had about six weeks, really, of, archives because the, we were in the I did the, the uh, conference oh, in Chicago yeah, right. before I left mm-hmm. I think we could even back it up more than that uh, we did a conference in uh, Eureka Springs Arkansas it was on 10-10-10 mm-hmm. and in that we did the show right before that one so that was the last one we did was it because mm-hmm. that was the one where mm-hmm. uh, they did some ceremonies there for the 10-10-10 right And they bury crystals in the ground on what they thought was like vortexes. And you probably know out there that a lot of the crystals do come from Arkansas. This is where people come here to dig the crystals. For those of you in other countries, this is, they said, one of the largest crystal supply in the world. Right under our feet. (laughs) (laughs) Ooh. And uh, they do. I wonder if that has any correlation to you being here and what you get. (laughs) And all the weird stuff that happens. Yep. But um, people do, when they come to see me for uh, sessions, even, they take a few more days to go down to the crystal mines and get the crystals. So uh, there's a lot of crystals up there around Eureka Springs. So they said they did the ceremony where they buried more crystals, and the ceremony was to activate it all. Because that's supposed to be a special day, uh, mm-hmm. ten, ten, ten. Right. I don't really remember the, what the meaning of it was, but they put a lot of significance on it. Mm-hmm. So I did a lecture there. Then the next week I had to go to Chicago, and that was uh, Joanne Mac- Macos. Mm-hmm. What was the name of that? One? The Lightworkers. The conference. Lightworkers uh-huh. Conference in Chicago with Joanne Macko, and I've done several of hers, and. Um, that went fine, but then I come home, it was Sunday night, and I only had two days before we were going to go on this real long trip. So that night, in the middle of the night, I began to get a sore throat, and I came down the next morning with a real bad head cold. And, you know, I never get sick. So I knew what my body was trying to tell me. This is what I work in all the time. Your body is always talking to you. you got to listen to your body. It's trying to tell you things. And so I knew what it was trying to tell me. It said it wanted me to rest because in September we were in Europe, and then I had these other conferences. I'm getting ready to go on this long one. A body, the body was trying to tell me it wanted me to rest. How are you going to rest when we're getting ready to go on a long? You make me do all the work, and you can just <laughs> <back along. laughs> 
So anyway, <laughs> and I'm in the middle, of the, the middle of the night, getting a sore throat and a head cold, and I'm trying to count how many days is it going to have to be before I got to speak in Singapore, and maybe mm-hmm. it'll be gone. Right, right. <laughs> but I didn't have any choice anyway. So. Uh, we start out on this long trip, and I break it up because it's so far. But uh, the first talk was going to be in Singapore before we went down to Australia. So we started out, spent a night in Honolulu yeah. to break it up because that's eight hours from Dallas mm-hmm. to Honolulu. And then it's, I think, eight more hours mm-hmm. on to Tokyo. Right. Because you have to break these trips up. I do, anyway. I can't do 16-hour flights. Mm, That's a long flight. That's a really long flight. Mm -hmm. And coming back is bad enough with 12 hours. So we stopped in Honolulu. Then we went to Tokyo. But um, uh, one thing, we came into the Tokyo airport on the plane. Coming from Honolulu to Tokyo, we were the only... We can't say Americans. We were only Angles, I guess you would say. I don't know what to call us. What are we? <laughs> <laughs> On the whole plane, everybody else was Japanese, maybe Chinese going on. Mm-hmm. But uh, here we get off at the airport, and we were the only two Americans, two white people. I don't, I don't like to use that term. That's not really what it is. We were just different. <laughs> <laughs> we were the You're only different two ones. different ones. <laughs> Going through customs, just mm-hmm. us. Everybody else was going through the ones going into Japan. Yeah, so that would make us the only American. The only other ones, I guess. The only the, American. The only two. Uh, and the only uh, other, yeah. It, it's, uh, it is, I've had done this before, but it was Julie's first experience as being the odd one, being the one that's different. Uh, we're the minority. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's a funny feeling, everybody's staring at you. Well, I kept staring, and I was thinking, what are they looking at? And then I realized, oh, we look different. <laughs> so yeah. we're the different ones. So. And you said we're taller, for one right. thing, mm-hmm. but we stand out. And I think that's right. always a good lesson for anyone, if you travel, to be in a place where you are the different one. Mm-hmm. You're the minority. Mm-hmm. Then you can appreciate what the other people feel when they come over to our country. Right. <laughs> but as we got off the plane and we're headed into the airport, like I said, I had this cold, and it was really bad at that point. And we're going through, went through customs before that. There was a big camera uh, up above yeah. this place we had to go through. And it had a sign, you're now going into yeah. a quarantine area, right, right. and this is a <laughs> temperature camera. Uh-huh. So I said, oh, my gosh, I hope I don't have a temperature or they wouldn't let us into Tokyo. Right. So that's, we haven't found that in any other uh, mm-hmm. place we've gone. No, we just had the temperature gun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we went into them. Moscow. They wouldn't let you off the plane. They came down the aisle with a temperature gun, pointing it at everyone on the plane. Right. And I guess it was supposed to register your temperature. You saw it had a little uh, screen on it. Yeah, it was like an infrared. I think it would show, it would show if it... If you came up as a hot spot or something like that, it'd be, yeah. that would be a temperature. <laughs> so they were aiming it at everyone as they went down, and I guess if you had a temperature, you couldn't get off or the fever. plane. If you had a fever, not temperature. Hopefully you had a temperature. <laughs> <laughs> but also, was that the place they came in and sprayed everybody? Uh, yes. In, in Russia? <laughs> On the Moscow. No, no, that was from the Africa plane, Africa to Australia. They, last year. Yeah, last year they came on and sprayed. They just went down the roads with cans of spray, and they're like, cover your mouth. <laughs> cover your eyes. And they spraying everything before you were even allowed to get off the plane. Yeah. I just thought it was funny. Amer- some of these Americans are complaining about these full-body scanners yeah. and all these things. <laughs> they would really think all of this was an invasion of privacy. Right, yeah. Yeah. Where they're going, taking the temperature gun and spraying well, and everybody. Spraying, and then the eye scanners, and the, I mean, <laughs> get over it, people. It's just the way we live now. So <laughs> and they were taking fingerprints in some mm-hmm. pe- places. Right. Uh, but still, the security was a lot uh, easier than it is in the states once we got out of the country. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, that's, they talk about invasion of privacy, and uh, that, it's just what you do. It didn't bother us. I was just hoping that temperature <laughs> camera wasn't going to say I had a fever. Yeah. But 
uh, we were only in uh, Moscow, in uh, Moscow. We were only in Tokyo the one night just to break the trip up. But the people there were so polite. Mm-hmm. The right. Japanese people. Yeah. <laughs> on the plane and on the. <laughs> the stewardess. Yes. Very, very polite people. Mm-hmm. Bowing and uh, very soft voices. Mm-hmm. And we can learn a lot from them. They <laughs> they really have nice manners. Mm-hmm. But that was in Tokyo. And then we had to go on from there to um, to mm-hmm. Singapore. And by the time we were getting there, I kept thinking, well, I hope I'm getting over this. It was getting easier. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were there. So was there a day. I had to do the talk that day, I think, when I got in there. I don't remember, it was so long ago now, it was the middle of October, but I had to do a lecture in Singapore, and we had a really good turnout. Mm -hmm. And in all the lectures I was doing on this trip, I was doing three hours, uh, mostly the two-hour lecture, and then I did a group regression of Mm -hmm. the whole audience. Right. So it was a little different than my normal lecture, and I was talking about the three waves of volunteers and the... uh, Mm -hmm. um, 2012, the New Earth, and all of that. Mm-hmm. But um, I was just trying to keep from coughing while I had trying to put the whole room full under with the group <laughs> progression. But we had a really good reception in mm-hmm. Singapore, and they want me to come back. And they said, would we have enough to have a class if I came back next year? And a lot of them said, yes, they wanted to do a class. Mm-hmm. So it looks like we'll be going back next year to do the class. But uh, Singapore is a really nice place. I've been there about just 13, 12, 13 12, years. 12 years ago was the last time you were there. Yeah, and it has changed some. They're not quite as strict and severe as they used to be. Yeah. Uh, they still have their laws. They always say Singapore is a fine yeah. city. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we got to do our Christmas shopping. We did have one day off, and so we went down into Chinatown and got my Christmas shopping done. But um, even the cab driver was telling us, Singapore is considered to be the safest city in the world. And the reason is because of all of these Mm -hmm. tough laws that they have. They don't mess around, so... Uh, if you're going over there, you got to be prepared for that. You don't take a chance in doing anything they don't want you to do, because they said that's why they don't have have very little crime, because they don't mess around. You just mm-hmm. go right to jail. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't know if there's any trials or not, but they just said uh, they just haul you off. Mm-hmm. So people are too afraid to do anything that there's no crime. Very, very little crime because they really are strict punishment. I don't want to say afraid because I don't pin sense any fear. The people were really happy. Right, but no, it probably is afraid. <laughs> it's it's like Big Brother. I mean, they're they're watching, so you know they know you you're what you're doing, and they know you're. I mean, they just know, so they just they just mind their p's and q's. It's kind of like that. It's just they just know not to do stuff. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, when I was there twelve years ago, I asked them. Doesn't it bother you? They know where you are at any time. Mm-hmm. They have advanced, advanced computer systems. They know where everybody is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is kind of like Big Brother. And I asked them, doesn't that bother you? And they said, no, it's like they're our parents, and they care about us. Yeah, but you asked them this time, you know, and it's probably younger people that you were talking to, and they didn't even seem to know what you are talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when you were talking to um, to Lee? And you were asking him that, and he was kind of surprised. He didn't realize they had all that. So it's like it must not be real obvious. Anymore. Right. Uh-huh. But uh, Singapore was one of the places where they always tried out the new technology. Yeah. And that's when I heard mm-hmm. before when I went over there. That's where the computers started mm-hmm. and all the advanced well, ways to track people and the uh, how they could they have cards yeah, so they know yeah. where everybody yeah. is. They have all the latest gadgets and gadgets. <laughs> yeah, so. but they started the computers over there and all of these things way before they went anywhere else to see if they were going to work. So I think they probably do have the latest mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there is a lot of young people now, so they aren't as strict as they used to be. Well, 
I don't know. I just know when you asked them that they they didn't really know what you're. He didn't see it that way, the way you were referring to it. So, yeah. so it could be it's it's not that obvious. Maybe not anymore because 12 years ago they wanted to know what books we were bringing in. They had to approve of the books. They had to know what we were going to lecture about. Mm -hmm. This time they didn't. Yeah, they did. He did had they? to. Yeah, he had to get permission. Um, but it wasn't. He normally doesn't have any problem, and he had a little problem. This time it took him a while to get the the approval, and he figured it out it's because you had been there before, and so you were on record, and that's where they had. It took them a while to check all that out. So normally they said it came right back, and on this time it, it took a while to get that approval back. So. I didn't know about that part. Yeah, you had to be approved to come in. So. Looks like Dubai is mm -hmm. the same way. You couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we went to Dubai. You, they had to know what books we were going to bring mm -hmm. in, and they had to approve of any books we were going to be selling. Mm -hmm. I got so many books that we can always bring some in mm -hmm. that will be something that will be okay. Right. But. Uh, now they don't seem to have any objection with the hypnosis or any of that. Right. Well, they do a lot of healing things there. Oh, yeah, the so, Chinese mm -hmm. especially, uh, they've had that forever. Mm -hmm. go, the healing methods go way back. So that's something they really are mm -hmm. into. Oh, I forgot when we started out. Let me give you the toll-free number. I didn't even <laughs> think about it. We just dove right in. It's been five weeks, people. <laughs> Six weeks, whatever. Yeah, we got to get our we, our heads still aren't in there together. And she says that plurally. She means herself. Uh, well, you're you're back to normal. I'm back right? now. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anyway, I forgot about that. The uh, the toll-free number in case anyone does want to call in and ask us some questions. The toll-free number is one eight eight eight. 815-9756, Oh, we'll be okay by next week. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, you yeah, know, Singapore, it was a nice city, and, mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, city country. Yeah, because <laughs> the whole island, it is an island, and it, the city is the, is the whole, it's that's the all Singapore is. That's right. <laughs> and it's nothing but a city. Mm -hmm. There is no countryside. There's nothing. It's just all that, all buildings. Everything well, I has... I think they said there was a little countryside. There's just not... Not much. No, huh? Because everything has... Yeah, because they want to build it all up. So. Yeah. Everything has to be shipped in. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing is manufactured there. There is uh, even the water used to be brought in from Malaysia. I think now they've found mm -hmm. a way to desalinate mm -hmm. the water, the seawater, take the salt out. Yeah, They're and then they also that. recycle their gray water. They said. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it used to be they had they had to stay good friends with Malaysia because their water came from there. But everything is shipped in because nothing is manufactured or grown there at all. And they said they have five million people. But they're wanting to have as many as seven million. Yeah, seven to eight million is what they want to grow to. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, what do you? How do you do that on an island? Because all the land is already taken up with buildings. But um, what they're doing, they're reclaiming land mm -hmm. from the ocean. Right, and they're also building taller buildings. <laughs> yeah, they're going up. They either got to go up or out. Mm -hmm. So they're making the buildings taller. This is happening a lot of countries right. we've gone to. They're right. just making all the apartments are in real tall buildings, no mm -hmm. houses. Right. And But they're reclaiming the land from the ocean. And first they were doing that when we were in Texas years ago, mm -hmm. living in Texas. They just make land. Where there is none. Where there is none. <laughs> out in the middle of the ocean. They'll, See, they'll nothing's make... impossible. <laughs> So they just create land out there, and that's where they're going to put more buildings on. Now who says we aren't great and powerful beings and we aren't creators? <laughs> See, they create land where there is none. <laughs> well, in Dubai, they take there's no mm -hmm. water at all, but they take the ocean water mm -hmm. from the Persian Gulf, and they desalinate it, mm -hmm. and they're able to use it, so it's the same thing. Yep. If you have to, you'll figure out a way. But, yeah, they have to make it bigger because they're growing and they got to either go higher or go uh, out. But one thing I liked about Singapore when I was there before, uh, they had the good sense to leave parks and trees. Mm -hmm. When I was in Hong Kong 12 years ago, see, they cut all their trees down to build more and more buildings. And it's the, the most crowded city in the world, 
but it's also very polluted because you need the trees to clean the air. And they don't have anything like that in Hong Kong. But Singapore was smart. They made it part of their plan to have parks and trees. So that's helping, even though they got a lot of people. It helps clean the air. Mm-hmm. So uh, Hong Kong should have learned a lesson from that, but they didn't. So, we're, you know, it's one thing about traveling. You do find out a lot of interesting things as we go along. Right. And I think it would be good for people to travel because one thing about traveling, you find out we're all alike. The world becomes very small. It does. It, it keeps getting oh, I, well, smaller for us because yeah. Well, as a, as a thing, I thought it was so funny, and I mentioned it when I came back here. I mean, okay, we're, this is a very small state. Arkansas is small. It has very, it's not very populated. Yeah. Our entire state population is less than a mid-sized city, <laughs> really. Yeah, because you know? it's mostly woods and, <laughs> right. and mountains. Right, I mean, it's, I don't It's know. a very rural. Yeah. rural. <laughs> okay, not that many people, and people think that we're all backwoodsy and we don't do much here, okay? Uh-huh. Right? Hillbillies. hillbillies yeah, yeah, we're hillbillies. Proud of it. Okay, fine. We're hillbillies. We are in Australia. And well, I know we're going to get there in a minute, but we're going through custom. We're going through immigration as we come in. Yeah. And um, we're at the booth, at the immigration booth, and I'm hearing the people in the immigration booth next to us, and they're describing... You know, to the person, I didn't hear the first part of the conversation, the custom, the custom but he, official. yeah, and they're saying, well, it's right there. There's four states together. There's Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, and that's where we are, right there, where those four states are together. And I looked over, and I'm like, that's where we're from. And the the guy in the booth, the Australian, he's like, small world. Anyway, then we go, and we're going to mention all these places we went, but then we go to this dinner, all these people, and everybody's introducing each other, and the people right across from us used to live in the town, the city, right next to where we are now. Where the airport right, is. Right, and one of them used to be a, a Razorback. I used to be in the Razorback band, and we're like, and then they said, oh, yeah, and there's another couple here from Arkansas, too, and it's like, what? <laughs> so, people, we are Kansans get out. We get around. <laughs> we do get out and around. So, anyway, it is a small world. I mean, if you're going to find people from Arkansas on the other side of the world, it's a very small world. <laughs> in this little town. It's, yes, yes. Of course, it's a town that, uh, it's the headquarters of Walmart, but still, it doesn't have that many population. No, the whole state doesn't have that much. <laughs> so. And if you don't know what a Razorback is, that's the university football team. Right. Mm-hmm. Named after the Razorback Hogs. Mm-hmm. And Julie used to be in the Razorback band. But to yeah. find somebody on the other side mm-hmm. of the world who was right there, that's, that's really strange. It's very <laughs> strange. Very very. <laughs> but yeah, for us, anyway, we know the world is small because uh, we don't even know where we are half the time when we're mm-hmm. traveling, but everybody is like everybody else. A lot of this fear stuff people build up, being afraid of other nationalities, being afraid of other races, mm-hmm. that's all it is. It's just fear mongering. Well, it's because it's it's something you don't know, and anything you don't know, you're going to fear, and and, and that's they can play that on that because we don't know enough about it. Um, but just start traveling and going to these places, you'll find out these people are just like you. <laughs> we're all the same. <laughs> we just we all have the same objectives, you know, the same priorities, the same, you know, we, we, we are. In that way, we're all the same. They all yeah. want to have families take mm-hmm. care of them. They want to have jobs and make money to support mm-hmm. their families. <clears throat> It's usually the leaders are the ones mm-hmm. that want war. They're the ones that want to have all the conflicts. The people don't. They just want to live like the rest of us right. do. Right. They're just trying to get by, <laughs> trying to pay for their homes, pay for their food, pay for, you know, they're just, just like, and that, that you'll find everywhere. Everybody's in the same situation. Yeah. You know, trying to go day to day. So, so that's what I say. If more people traveled, we wouldn't have the violence, the wars that we do. Mm-hmm. We'd find out we're all alike. Mm-hmm. We're right. just people. <clears throat> but anyway, Singapore was an interesting place. <clears throat> so we're there for it. We got our Christmas shopping done. I'm not going to say what we bought, but we got our Christmas shopping done. <laughs> <clears throat> 
I like to buy my Christmas presents in other countries because it gets something they don't normally right. get here. Right. So then we go down from Singapore. We flew to Perth. And see, even those are really long flights. None of those are short. Mm-hmm. That's why we had to keep breaking it up. Right, right. But we went to Perth, and I've been back there so many times, and I did the class there. Did the lecture and the tech class. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's where we were at Halloween. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. And they think it's so funny because they think uh, Halloween is an American holiday. And mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. don't really celebrate it over. They never have. It's mm-hmm. not a big thing. But the kids are beginning to bring it in. Well, yeah, they had on their morning talk show. I think it was the day of, or the day, yeah, it was the day of Halloween. It wasn't, you know, for that night. And they were talking about that, and they were saying that it's starting to be embraced over there. And so that's what we were seeing. It was just starting to be acknowledged. Yeah, it was an American holiday, but they're taking it on. And they're like, oh, this is what they do in America. Maybe we should do it. And they say, oh, you know, all the stores are are grabbing on to it. And I realized, oh, it's just really kind of catching on. It's, so they're just now really seeing uh, Halloween. I think the main <laughs> thing they were doing was the costumes. Yeah, yeah. But not as much as they were trying can. to talk about, well, how are you going to explain to your kids what the costumes meant? I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> That was a long time ago we were doing that. <laughs> so <laughs> They aren't into the candy yet and trick-or-treat because they said, I don't know if I'd like right. my kids to go up knocking on a stranger's right. door. Asking, asking for, for candy. candy. That's what I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's what you do. <laughs> so. But uh, they're just starting to have the parties with the mm-hmm. costumes. So it was funny. And they were just, mm-hmm. it had no big lead in like we do. It no. was just mostly no. that day they yeah. go and get the costumes right. and right. have a party. Right. Yeah, they they haven't gotten the full Western approach to it yet. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll learn. <laughs> so we are influencing the world with our bad habits. <laughs> well, I think it's called commercialism. <laughs> so. yeah. Okay. So anyway, yeah, Perth it was nice. By that time, I was beginning to get over my cold anyway after I left Singapore, and it was beginning to feel mm-hmm. like I could make the rest of the trip. Get, usually, the week is about as long mm-hmm. as it'll last mm-hmm. anyway. Plus, so, it was warmer there, too, so that was nice. Started yeah, they're having out. their summer yeah. there now. Well, they're going into their summer. Yeah. But uh, we had 220 people mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. the lecture uh-huh. in Perth, and right. we had uh, a big class. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So every time I go back to Perth, it's getting bigger and bigger. We have our advanced classes there now. And the people we I've trained are taking this and really using it, mm-hmm. and they're having wonderful results. Absolutely. Everybody in the class, I think, was really having really good. I mean, in the advanced, the advanced. The level two class, we're having really good results. Mm-hmm. And it's like Australia especially is taking my method and really going with it. And, they're, and it shows it can be taught, and mm-hmm. they're – they're having the same miracles that I'm having. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was in Perth. But the next place, every time I've gone to Australia, and I've been going since the early 90s, I always wanted to go to Ayers Rock. Now, we've always just gone from Perth to Sydney mm-hmm. or Melbourne or Brisbane, one coast to the other. And I always wanted to see Ayers Rock. One reason is I've written about it in my books, I told you before I went to uh, we went to mm-hmm. south of France. Right. I wanted to see those places because I've written about it. I wrote about Ayers Rock, and I've always wanted to see it, but we never could work it into the schedule. This time we barely worked it in. We only had two days. One problem is they only have one flight going in there. But if you can imagine, some of you probably don't know, Australia is as big as the United States. Now, if you could figure the United States with L.A. and New York and and Miami Miami, Mm -hmm. and And nothing in the middle (laughs) except one little town right smack in the middle, Mm -hmm. and that's Alice Springs. Of course, they have little bitty towns all Mm -hmm. over the place. But, I mean, can you imagine the United States with nothing in the middle but desert and I have to tell you, well, I'm I'm going to call it Planet Australia, 
Australia is another planet. I'm not sure where it came from. I really don't. <laughs> it's well, different. They, they said it was the original of the Earth and everything mm-hmm, else caught mm-hmm. and split off from Australia. Yeah, but it is so different. Looking at it from the plane, when we were flying over it, the landscape, everything did not, it looked unearthly. It was so different. Uh, I it's just I don't <laughs> I don't know I'm sure there's a story to it but um, yeah she so she kept saying it looked like we were flying over another planet I we've never seen landscape like that anywhere mm-hmm. else right mm-hmm. and I kept asking the stewardess what was that down there uh, that was that wasn't the landscape I'm talking about though. it was the other part wasn't yeah it? yeah that was even weirder than that uh-huh. <laughs> so. But see, if you've got all of that land and it's desert, the only ones that could live out there would be aborigines. Mm-hmm. But the, they talk about people have ranches, thousands and thousands of acre ranches, mm-hmm. but they've learned how to find water, learned how to live. Mm-hmm. But the only ones out there in the desert, oh, it's a million times bigger than the Sahara, and all mm-hmm. of that. And there's no water. We couldn't see any rivers. Mm-hmm. We saw a lot of dried up things. Right. But... There was things we were flying to. We had to go to Alice Springs first, and I kept asking the stewardess what it was, and she said salt lakes, but it was all dried up, just like it was all white, like salt lakes. Right. And mm-hmm. in the States, we have the Great Salt Lake up by Utah, but if you can imagine those for miles and miles mm-hmm. and miles of desert with just right. these mm-hmm. dried up salt lakes all over it, no sign of life, no signs of houses, nothing out mm-hmm. there. No roads, nothing. Total desolation. And it's it's a little hard for you to understand if, unless you think of it in comparison to the United States and nothing from L.A. all the way across. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of land mm-hmm. with nothing there. No, they have a lot of land. It's like, it seems like they should be able to, they could use, they probably could if we got to a point where we are just so populated and we have to have some place to go, that would probably be it. We'd figure out a way to make it work, you know, so. Yeah, like they mm-hmm. did with the water and everything. Right. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but There's a lot of land over there, everybody. <laughs> but the majority of the people in Australia live on the coast. Mm-hmm. The cities are all around the coast. Mm-hmm. Well, an interesting fact, I don't know if you heard, I can't remember if it was who it was that was saying it. It was either a taxi driver or it was uh, Jason. Someone was telling us that over in, the, in that area in the middle, uh, none of those kids go to school. They're all, um, they're all, their school, they're, none of them see a building. They're all done by uh, computer and by telephone, and by, by walkie-talkie, stuff like that. They all, they don't, none of them go to a classroom. Why was that? Because it's too far to go. They, they all live out and everything, so they, they don't go to a class. They, they do it at home. They all do it at home. The ones that are on the ranches mm-hmm. or what? Yeah. Yeah, they're all in those ranches. Yeah, not probably not Alice Springs. It's probably like up there, you know, outside of there. So because I, they were talking about some of those ranches, like mm-hmm. tens of thousands mm-hmm. of acres. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they're so big they had to patrol them by helicopter. Mm-hmm. They can't do it yeah. with a horse. Yeah, they said none of those kids go to school. They all go. They they all do school by telephone or, or remote. You know, by with something the computer, like that. Probably the yeah. computer. Stuff. Well, they do a bunch of different things, but none of them have seen. They don't see a classroom. I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> so, if you don't see any other classmates, there mm-hmm. wouldn't be any football teams. Nope. There wouldn't be any no, of that. No, no bands. <laughs> no. Hmm. People in America could learn a lot from that, I guess. Well, it just shows how things change and adapt. You know what you have to do. That's kind of like what we used to be like. You know, and people. It used just, to be country. Yeah, when it was country, and then they just did stuff at home. So. Hmm. But. Um, I just well, couldn't. it shows you we think everything's like we are. It shows you, no, some places are not. I mean, even though Australia is a very developed country, but it's not, not that far. <laughs> no, not that huh? far. So, I was yeah. trying to think when I went to Wyoming or Montana up in mm-hmm. there, there's places like that yeah. where there's miles between right, each right. farm. Yeah, see, places like that have to adapt. <clears throat> you know, you have to do something. Yeah, they had. They couldn't go to school or they couldn't mm-hmm. go to their next neighbor because all the snow they have up there. Right. So there are places that are different than what we think they are. But um, anyway, we fly into Alice Springs, and I was thinking, what in the world would anybody want to put a city out here in the middle of nowhere? But they say, what well, they said, it's a hub. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the busiest <laughs> place of the whole country because it's a hub. 
for everything. That's everything cool. going, through, it goes through there. It hasn't got any Cargo, more. everything goes through there. But there isn't <laughs> so. any other way to do it, I guess. That's mm-hmm. it, it's just there in the middle of the uh, of Australia. Right. And they said, I guess, when these, like the wagon trains, like they mm-hmm. used to have in America, they had them over there going to find places to live. Right. Right. They got that far and decided to stop. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. But they said the reason they stopped was because it's called Alice Springs. Mm-hmm. They found out, oh, they told us there's a huge abundance of water right there in the middle of the desert. It's a, but they called it a bubble of water. They called under, it a ball of water. Well, under Alice Springs. I don't know really what that means, a ball of water. But they <laughs> so. said they had more water in Alice Springs and some of the other big cities mm-hmm. in Australia. Mm-hmm. And those the uh, bigger cities have oh, to. They had like three times the amount of water that the, uh, the, the places on the coast had. So the coasts were in drought all the time, and... They were used. No, they were using three times as much as anybody else, and yet they were supposed to. It was all supposed to be a drought, and so they mm-hmm. so they had plenty of water. Because in the big cities, they're trying to conserve water. Right. But here, Alice Springs has just got this huge abundance of water, and they right underneath that. Right. So I don't know how those old timers knew that when they decided to settle there. <laughs> Probably <laughs> witched it. They they could feel it. Remember, they they knew how to feel water. We well, lost the that ability. Yeah. Probably would have told them Absolutely. too. Absolutely, they know how to feel water. Water has a certain energy, so. But that's why they built. And it's called mm-hmm. Alice Springs. Mm-hmm. It was named after the guy's wife, right? Like mm-hmm. Sedona. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we told them that we were in Sedona. Mm-hmm. It was originally the man wanted to call it Smedley. Yeah, Smedley, Smedley. Junction or Smedley something. <laughs> so. <laughs> And they said too it long. was too long of a name, so they just named it after his wife, Sedona. Mm-hmm. So Sedona wouldn't be the same if it was called Schmedley. Yeah, right. So there's two places that are vortexes that mm-hmm. have a very powerful energy named after the guy's yeah. wife. Yeah, now that's something. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I guess we could well, first go I, ahead and talk about First I want to tell them when we get off the plane yeah. in Alice Springs, oh boy. We were deluged by flies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they followed us into the airport and just kept going with us. It's like, my gosh. <laughs> as soon as you get off the plane, there's a million trillion flies all over the place, and they're trying to get in your nose, in your mouth. And, I've, you know, we first went there, we heard tales of all the flies in the outback, and they have these hats. Mm-hmm that uh, they buy, and they have little corks yeah. on string. I almost bought one, but I decided not to. <laughs> oh, it's like a cowboy hat, but yeah. all along the edge, they have little strings with corks mm-hmm. on them. And that's supposed to be for that area. You shake your head, and the corks are supposed to keep the flies away. They were also selling uh, nets to put mm-hmm. over your face right, if right. you were going to be there very long or if you were going to go out and hike. Mm-hmm. But it was... Uh, yeah, and then I, we got off. I was like, told you're not an Australian until you swallowed a fly. <laughs> <laughs> so they said after a while they don't even try to shoo them away. They're just way, way too many. <laughs> but they were, oh, my gosh, there were so many flies. And we could wait to get into the airport and then try yeah. to get back to our room. But tell them the story about, uh, see, Jason is the man who set up my talks on the eastern mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. He was telling about the woman who said she wanted to go with yeah, him. Yeah, it was some project, whatever he, he used to do, and some project that they were working he on. He went out and, into the outback. Yeah, he would go out, and it was, it was uh, they had a, it was a four-mile drive to this campsite that they were going to that where they were working, and she was like, that's fine. He kept trying to explain to her, it's rough. There's no, I mean, our only gas or petrol is right here. We have to get it before we leave because there's nothing out there. Okay, that's fine. And, no food. And we have, we have to take everything Everything we, we take, I mean, that's that's all we have. Okay, that's wonderful. I'm I'm fine with that. That's that's fine. He tried to explain it's going to be hot. There's flies. There's all this. That's it's okay. I'm fine with it. And so they drive out there, and they're four hours. Four hours. And so she didn't even make it a half an hour. She said, I can't stand. I can't handle these flies. You have to take me back. I cannot handle the flies. <laughs> so, so that's so, it's a big deal. <laughs> and there's something we were not expecting. No. Uh. Uh-uh. No, not at all. Not at that at all. We've heard about it, but I didn't didn't realize that. Well, they're great. Yeah, they just they're right on you. <laughs> they're not shy at all. <laughs> but I've had people in the states when I've gone to the UFO conference. I had one young man come up to me, 
And he heard all the stories about there's probably UFO bases out in the middle of Australia. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it a bit. It's so isolated, I don't think anybody would ever know where they were. They wouldn't know how to find them in the first place. Right. But there's all these stories about UFOs in the middle of Australia, mm-hmm. um, bases. So this guy said, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to find the base. And I said, have you ever been to Australia? He said, no. Shouldn't be so hard, though. I said, you don't know anything about the outback, do you? Yeah. (laughs) The first place, they said, you go out there, you could die very easily. There's no stores. There's no gas. There's no food. And they're the most poisonous things in the world or in Australia. It's not a place to play around with. The Aborigines have learned to live. Mm-hmm. There, they're quite remarkable, mm-hmm. like yeah. the American Indians. Right. They know yeah, well, how. They, they're part of the land. They know how to work with it. So, but uh, no, it's not something to fool around with. Once you get out there, and they said you could be totally lost. You mm-hmm. had no idea where in the world you were. But uh, we went to Alice Springs because that's where the you had to fly into. Then we had to take a little puddle jumper on to uh, to Air's Rock just like a half an hour flight. But because he only had the one flight a day, and we were just going to be able to be there that one day and have to leave the next morning. And I always wanted to see it. So we get there, and um, Julia found online they had what they called dinner under the stars. It was going to be out by Ayers Rock. Yeah, sunset. You watched the sunset behind Ayers Rock. So we went out there, and they took the bus, took us mm-hmm. out, and this is a national park, mm-hmm. and the only thing there is just this, where these hotels are. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there isn't anything else. Yeah, that's well, that's because everybody coming there is just coming to see that rock. <laughs> so The park, they want to go out and mm-hmm. hike or something. Mm-hmm. But they had the, the airport, and they, had, they took you over to the hotels, and then they took us out in the desert where they were going to have the dinner. And uh, we... Got to watch the sun set over the rock, mm-hmm. behind the earth's rock. No, it was on our side. It was, remember, it was over here. You yeah. just watched it cast shadows on the rock and everything. That's what I've written about in my book, that it's a bright red rock, but they said it'll change colors and the different light. Mm-hmm. So we, it mm-hmm. turned purple right before mm-hmm. it, yeah. the sun went yeah. down. Very pretty. Very nice. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were watching that, but you had to stay right where... Oh, they told you to go <laughs> because they said it has a very delicate ecosystem out there. Was the one thing they didn't want people mm-hmm. going wandering around out there to disturb, and it's a very delicate balance. Even though it does, it just look like desert and mm-hmm. few, you know, scrubby plants. There's nothing that we could live on. I don't think so delicate about it. <laughs> so not they, much of it. <laughs> so they said it's a delicate ecosystem. So they didn't want you going out there. And also, they said we don't know what's out there. Mm-hmm. All kinds of critters. So we had to stay right where they had the tables set up, and they were going to have the dinner. And they have a little light. The little lights. Mm-hmm. To show you how to get mm-hmm. to the to the restroom, mm-hmm. otherwise it's pitch black out there. And the dinner you got to have uh, they had hors d'oeuvres and mm-hmm. stuff, and they were all eating out there. And Julie was braver than I was. Well, you know, when in these other countries you want to you want to experience some of the things that they that they do. You know, you want to have original experiences. Mm-hmm. That might only happen there. So So part of the food they had was crocodile and uh, kangaroo. Yep. Yes, folks, I ate some crocodile and some kangaroo. (laughs) I couldn't bring myself to do it. Oh. But uh, I did. I think I did eat one of those little crocodile hors d'oeuvres anyway. Yeah, it was done very well. It was crusted and had some lemon stuff on it. So it really just was like a light, it's like a light chicken that has a little bit of a fish taste. But it really didn't have much of a taste if you can taste the lemon on it. <laughs> so, uh, well, it was like, uh, just the idea turned me off anyway. Yeah, and I but couldn't. I wanted to say I did it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we had the dinner, and the sun went down, and it's getting very, very dark. And they had a man who was called the Star Talker, and he they turned all the lights off so you could see the sky. And 
it's beautiful because there's no city lights. There's nothing around anywhere to cause any mm-hmm. reflections. All, right. all, all you could see was this black, black sky mm-hmm. and all the stars. Mm-hmm. And there was no moon either. That right. helped. Right. Mm-hmm. And you could see the uh, Milky Way. Mm-hmm. Now, where we live up here on our mountain in Arkansas, we can see it at night because we're a long way away from mm-hmm. bright mm-hmm. lights. Right. But this is the other side of the world. So they were pointing out the different constellations, and he was telling the stories <laughs> of uh, there's you know constellations there that we don't have in the states, right? And um, on this side of the world, <coughs> one thing I always thought it was strange when I was over there before, when I was looking at the sky, you probably don't notice when you look up, but all of a sudden you look up and things do look different. They're not the same that you're used to seeing because there were different constellations. And the one woman I was here before mm-hmm. was trying to show me the uh, a Southern Cross. Mm-hmm. So that's what mm-hmm. they have on their flag is the Southern right. Cross. And I said, we don't have that, but I said, we do have Orion. So she said, we have Orion too. And I looked at him and I said, there's something wrong with Orion. It doesn't look the same. I figured out he's standing on his head. He was upside down. So you really are on the other side of the world. Hmm. And what the man, the star talker, said, he said either they're upside down, the stars are upside down, or we're upside down. Yeah. <laughs> One or the other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't look the same. And also on that part of the world, the moon phases are opposite of what they are here. That's funny when you go from one place to the other and you see it a crescent moon in one place and then you go to the other in Australia, the crescent moon is on the other side of the moon. Uh, things get a little weird. But I'm telling you, it's another planet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> but um, Maybe we went on the other side of the Earth and didn't... I mean, on the other side of the, the sun. <laughs> we were in the other hemisphere. <laughs> But, you know, you were talking about the UFOs when I was, I've done so much stuff in Australia, and this is in one of my books, that there was some people living out there in the outback, a little bitty tiny town, Mm -hmm. and they wanted me to come. This was years ago, because they said they had an alleyway where the UFOs flew over there all the time, and they wanted me to come and uh, meet with them. And it was like going into the Old West. That's what it looked like, a little old western town. We would have thought straight out of the movie. Mm-hmm. A little general store. And the only heat in it was a pot belly stove, just like the old western movies. Mm-hmm. And they, the women all brought in food like a potluck. And they proceeded to tell me all the tales about all the UFOs that were going over all the time. Well, we and, need to go back there. I'm going to go see that. It was interesting. The the one woman was 90, and she was this town historian, Mm -hmm. and she kept a record of all the sightings. And uh, so there are things going on out Mm -hmm. there, Mm -hmm. because that's a long way. I doubt it a bit. (laughs) Not a bit. So that we did have, I did have a chance to see that, and I did write about some of the stories that I heard about Mm -hmm. in one of my books. I can't remember which one it was now, one of the convoluted books. I think it was convoluted. One. One or two. One or two. Uh-huh. But um, it shows there is UFO activity out there because there's, there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. It's like we drive from Las Vegas down to Laughlin. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's perfect area for them to be hidden. Yeah, there's <laughs> desert down that way, and there's mm-hmm. no no towns around, so nobody's going to see them. Right. But out there... Uh, all oh, those millions of stars. I mean, they could have been up there. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. But it was really nice. You sit out there and look at the stars, and uh, you could see so many. Mm-hmm. And the Milky Way and all of it. Well, it was, the detail that you could see was really nice. I mean, because he would say, I thought it was a cloud, you know, or something like that. And it was actually a cluster of stars. Uh-huh. And it was just... But it, and there was two of them. That's one of the ways that they can tell their true south is by these two clusters, and then you make a, a triangle from those. He said that's and, what um, the, the old people yeah. used to do way back. And I was thinking it was a cloud because it was just, you know, hazy right there. Well, it was a cloud. It was a star cluster. And it's like, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. And, yeah, because it's like you're in the desert. There's no buildings, no trees, nothing, just mm-hmm. 
straight horizon, nothing to break your view. It's all you could see with stars everywhere. So that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I think we go back because they had some other trips we could take. Yeah, next time we're going to go, we actually go right up to the rock. And we found out there. about that. It was too late. Right. Because I had to go on, so we didn't have time to uh, yeah. to stay there and experiment any longer. Next time we'll know about the flies mm-hmm. going to mm-hmm. Dallas Springs, and we'll know mm-hmm. about Ayers Rock. But they had a lot of other trips people would take if they wanted to go mm-hmm. out and hike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can, you can do it if you want. I yeah. have no ambition to go out there with all those flies and all those critters. But I'm going to walk around the rock. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I guess I don't have as much of a sense of adventure as a lot of people do <laughs> when it comes to that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, we're here to learn and experience, and it's like, you know, what? <laughs> let's see how much we can see and how much we can do. And But you were talking about you wanted to eat what they ate. Well, well I just wanted to, to experience that. I wanted to just... You know, I mean, I, one one was enough. I mean, I had a little more can. I think I had a little more of each of them. You know, just the kangaroo maybe at the dinner, and that was tough. There, the first one, the appetizer was was nice. It was just a small piece, and you said it was kind of it, uh, chewy. It's like beef. It was yeah. The one at the dinner was tough. It was a little tough, but um, um, just just to experience it. It's not like I'm going to make it part of my diet. <laughs> I just wanted to experience it. That was it. Just like I'll really? experience calamari or another. I do draw the line on a few things because it's too obvious, and I don't want it to be obvious in my face, you know. <laughs> so. Well, see, Julie is the more adventurous one. When we were in Ireland last year in Dublin. That doesn't take, that's not adventurous. No, no I mean, <laughs> you say, I want to eat what's here. Mm-hmm. So in Dublin last year, she wanted the real Irish stew. Yeah, but how, how much courage did that take? Not courage, but I mean... <laughs> You want to experience? Yeah, I want to experience things. it. You're there. You're in the. You're in the country. Let's have. It's the flavor of the country. It's experiencing the country. It's experiencing the area. And the real Irish stew was made with lamb. What right. you had, that mm-hmm. was good. Yeah, it was wonderful. And then we were in Singapore. We had real Chinese. Food. Yeah, yeah. It was. Is it dum sim? It was a dum sim. Something I can't. It was sim dum sim. I think is what they called it. It had the little, little, small little pouches of things and that uh-huh. was wonderful. Yeah, we had a uh was a they a big selection. They just brought all this different Chinese food out. We mm-hmm. got to eat it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes eating the real stuff mm-hmm. is big it's a big difference. See? It's fun, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and who cares that you don't know what you're getting? I mean you just try it and but what's the worst I, that can happen? But when I was there twelve <laughs> years ago and ate off a buffet mm-hmm. they had uh, chicken feet soup. Well, that's what I'm saying. As long as it's not obvious. If it's obvious and in your face, then I that's where I draw the line, you know. Because so. that time it was the chicken foot sticking up yeah. out of the soup, and I yeah. said, no, that and I'm not And then they'll have those eat. little octopuses. No, I don't, want, I don't want eyeballs. I don't want brains. You know, I don't want anything obvious, you know. I'm not, I'm not that adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. But still, we got the real Chinese food on this trip, but we got to try the kangaroo and the crocodile. So then we had to leave and run out of time. I figured we had enough to talk about on this trip that we got a lot more. Oh, we probably got enough for three shows. <laughs> because and it was I was a long trip, remember? <laughs> and I don't think people are bored because some of these stuff they don't know. Mm-hmm. As they said, take us along on the trip. Yeah, and we're not paid by the countries <laughs> to advertise for them. We certainly don't. <laughs> but when I was in Singapore. Uh, one of the men that came to my class came from Thailand, right. and he said, "I heard about you on the internet, right. and he mm-hmm. heard my yeah, listen. He, he listened to this show yeah. every, every so he's Friday." He's probably out there. Hello. <laughs> I don't remember his name, but he either. said he listened to it every Friday night, and he downloads all the mm-hmm. archives. Mm-hmm. So, Don, there's one from Thailand. Mm-hmm. And before we left, we had an email from Portugal. Right. And they wanted to know, who is that other woman who is always on the show? It's me. <laughs> My daughter, Julia. So it does reach all over the world. So that's really, really wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, we're coming up to time to stop now. And, uh, the we, trip will be continued next week. <laughs> we'll tell you a lot more that you never knew about these places. 
and we'll continue next week. Okay, then I will get back to metaphysical stuff, but there is metaphysical stuff in this also. Yeah, it's called experiencing. That's why we're here. <laughs> Experience. Okay. Yes. All right. Anyway, thanks for listening tonight. And, you know, we all got back safely. We come back and it's cold and mm-hmm. it's snow, mm-hmm. and we don't know what time it is, what day it is. Yeah. It's next, Thanksgiving yesterday. So. <laughs> next week will be more oriented. Mm-hmm. Maybe. So good night, everyone, and thanks for listening. Good night. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.